Hello students, welcome to today's lecture on sugars as information molecules, detailed account of lactins, dietary fibers and their functions and glycoconjugates. The main objectives of the present module are to give a comprehensive idea on sugars as information molecules, to understand what are lactins and their functions, to help students understand the dietary fibers and their functions, to give a detailed account on glycoconjugates. To begin with, let's first have a comprehensive idea on sugars as information molecules. In the last few years, the determination of carbohydrate structure, especially the carbohydrate moiety of glycoconjugates, has been developed rapidly. On the other hand, owing to complexity of structures, carbohydrates are the biomolecules carrying large amounts of information. As informational molecules, carbohydrates play essential roles in living organisms including determination of antigenicity of molecules and phenotype of cells, and recognition in many physiological and pathological events. Carbohydrates can attach to proteins to form glycoproteins. Carbohydrate groups are covalently attached to many different proteins to form glycoproteins. Many glycoproteins are components of cell membranes where they play a variety of roles in processes such as cell adhesion and the binding of sperm to eggs. In glycoproteins, sugars are attached either to the amide nitrogen atom in the side chain of asparagine termed as N-linkage or to the oxygen atom in the side chain of serine or threonine termed as O-linkage. All N-linked oligosaccharides have in common a pentasaccharide core consisting of three mannose and two N-acetyl glucosamine residues. Additional sugars are attached to this core to form the great variety of oligosaccharide pattern found in glycoproteins. Carbohydrates are linked to some soluble proteins as well as membrane proteins. In particular, many of the proteins secreted from cells are glycosylated. Most proteins present in the serum component of blood are glycoproteins. Furthermore, N-acetylglucosamine residues are O-linked to some intracellular proteins. Protein glycosylation takes place inside the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi complex organelles that play central roles in protein trafficking. The N-linked glycosylation begins in the ER and continues in the Golgi complex, whereas the O-linked glycosylation takes place exclusively in the Golgi complex. Proteins in the lumen of the ER and in the ER membrane are transported to the Golgi complex, which is a stack of flattened membranous sacs. The Golgi complex has two principal roles. First, Carbohydrate units of glycoproteins are altered and elaborated in the Golgi complex. The O-linked sugar units are fashioned there and the N-linked sugars arriving from the ER as a component of glycoproteins are modified in many different ways. Second, the Golgi complex is the major sorting center of the cell. Proteins proceed from the Golgi complex to lysosomes. Secretory granules are the plasma membrane according to signals encoded within their amino acid sequence and three-dimensional structures. Golgi complex of a typical mammalian cell has three or four membranous sacs, cisterni. The Golgi complex is differentiated into a cis compartment, the receiving end, which is closest to the ER, medial compartment and a trans compartment which exports proteins to a variety of destinations. These components contain different enzymes and mediate distinctive functions. The N-linked carbohydrate units of glycoproteins are further modified in each of the compartments of the Golgi complex. In the cis-Golgi compartment, three mannose residues are removed from the oligosaccharide chain of protein destined for secretion or for insertion in the plasma membrane. The carbohydrate units of glycoproteins targeted to the lumen of lysosome are further modified. In the medial Golgi compartments of some cells, two more mannose residues are removed and two N-acetyl glucosamine residues and a fucose residue are added. Finally, in the trans-Golgi, another N-acetyl glucosamine residue can be added, followed by galactose and 
sialic acid to form a complex oligosaccharide unit. Note that N glycosylated proteins have in common a pentasaccharide core. Carbohydrate processing in the Golgi complex is termed terminal glycosylation to distinguish it from core glycosylation, which takes place in the endoplasmic reticulum. Tremendous structural diversification can occur as a result of the terminal glycosylation process. A carbohydrate marker in certain cases directs certain proteins from the Golgi complex to lysosomes. Mano-6-phosphate is in fact the marker that normally directs many hydrolytic enzymes from the Golgi complex to lysosomes. Eye cell patients are deficient in the phosphotransferase catalyzing the first step in the addition of the phosphoryl group. The consequence is that the mistargeting of eight essential enzymes. Let's have a detailed account of lactins now. Lactins are specific carbohydrate binding proteins. Different carbohydrate structures displayed on cell surfaces are well suited to serve as interaction sites between cells and their environments. Proteins termed lactins from the Latin legere to select are the partners that bind specific carbohydrate structures. Lactins are ubiquitous being found in animals, plants and microorganisms. It has been seen that some lectins such as calnexin function as chaperones in protein folding. The chief function of lectins in animals is to facilitate cell-cell contact. A lectin usually contains two or more binding sites for carbohydrate units. Some lectins form oligomeric structures with multiple binding sites. The binding sites of lectins on the surface of one cell interacts with arrays of carbohydrates displaced on the surface of another cell. Lectins and carbohydrates are linked by a number of relatively weak interactions that ensure specificity yet permit unlinking as needed. The interactions between one cell surface with carbohydrate and another with lectin resemble the action of Velcro. Each interaction is relatively weak but the composite is strong. Bacteria too contain lectins. E. coli bacteria are unable to adhere to epithelial cells of the gastrointestinal tract because lectins on the E. coli surface recognize oligosaccharide units on the surface of target cells. These lectins are located on slender hair-like appendages called fimbri or pili. Lectins are divided into classes on the basis of their amino acid sequence and biochemical properties. One large class is the C-type found in animals. It has been also observed that the ability of viruses to infect specific cell types is dictated in part by the ability of these viruses to bind to particular structures or receptors on the surface of cells in some cases, these receptors are carbohydrates. For example, influenza virus recognizes sialic acid residues present on cell surface glycoproteins. The viral protein that binds to these sugars is called hemagglutinin. After these surface interactions have taken place and the virus has been taken into the cell, another viral protein, neuraminidase, cleaves the glycosidic bond to the sialic acid residues, freeing the virus to infect the cell. Inhibitors of these enzymes are showing some promise as anti-influenza agents. Now let's understand the dietary fibers and their functions. Dietary fibers. Dietary fibers are found mainly in fruits, vegetables, whole grains and legumes, and are probably the best known for its ability to prevent or relieve constipation. Foods containing fibers can provide other health benefits as well, such as helping to maintain a healthy weight and lowering your risk of diabetes and heart disease. Selecting tasty foods that provide fiber is not difficult. Dietary fibers, also known as roughage, include the parts of plant foods 
your body can't digest or absorb. Unlike other foods, components such as fats, proteins, or carbohydrates, which your body breaks down and absorbs, fiber is not digested by your body. In a state, it passes relatively intact through our stomach, small intestine, and colon and out of our body. Now let's understand these fibers one by one. Soluble fibers, as the name indicates, this type of fiber dissolves in water to form a gel-like material. It can help lower blood, cholesterol, and glucose levels. Soluble fiber is found in oats, peas, beans, apple, citrus fruits, carrots, barley, psyllium. Insoluble fibers. This type of fiber promotes the movement of material through your digestive system and increases stool bulk, so it can be of benefit to those who struggle with constipation or irregular stools. Whole wheat flour, wheat bran, nuts, beans, and vegetables such as cauliflower, green beans, and potatoes are good source of insoluble fiber. Most plant-based foods such as oatmeal and beans contain both soluble and insoluble fiber. A high fiber diet has many benefits, which include, first, it normalizes bowel movements. Dietary fiber increases the weight and size of your stool and softens it. A bulky stool is easier to pass, decreasing your chance of constipation. It helps to maintain bowel health. A high fiber diet may lower your risk of developing hemorrhoids and small pouches in your colon, diverticular disease. Researchers are looking at how this may play a role in preventing disease of the colon. Third, it lowers cholesterol levels. Soluble fibers found in beans, oats, flax seeds, and oat bran may help lower total blood cholesterol levels by lowering low-density lipoprotein or bad cholesterol levels. Studies also have shown that high-fiber foods may have other heart health benefits such as reducing blood pressure and inflammation. Number four, high-fiber diet helps to control blood sugar levels. In people with diabetes, fiber, particularly soluble fiber, can slow the absorption of sugar and help improve blood sugar levels. A healthy diet that includes insoluble fiber may also reduce the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Number five, it aids in achieving healthy weight. High fiber food tends to be more filling than low fiber foods, so you are likely to eat less and stay satisfied longer. And high fiber foods tend to take longer to eat and to be less energy dense, which means they have fewer calories for the same volume of food. Another benefit attributed to dietary fiber is prevention of colorectal cancer. However, the evidence that fiber reduces colorectal cancer is mixed. The Institute of Medicine, which provides science-based advice on matters of medicine and health, gives the following daily fiber recommendations for adults. Refined or processed foods such as canned fruits and vegetables, pulp-free juices, white breads and pastas, and non-whole grain cereals are lower in fiber. The grain refining process removes the outer coat from the grain, which lowers its fiber content. Enriched foods have some of the B vitamins and iron back after processing, but not the fiber. Whole food rather than fiber supplements are generally better. Another way to get more fiber is to eat food such as cereals, granola bars, yogurt, and ice cream with fiber added. However, some people may still need a fiber supplement if dietary changes aren't sufficient or if they have certain medical conditions such as constipation, diarrhea, or irritable bowel syndrome. Also, drink plenty of water. Fiber works best when it absorbs water, making your stool soft and bulky. Now let's have a detailed account of glycoconjugates. Glycoconjugates is the general classification for carbohydrates covalently linked with other chemical species such as proteins, lipids, and saccharides. 
Glycoconjugates are formed in process termed glycosylation. Proteoglycans and glycoconjugates are macromolecules of the cell surface or extracellular matrix in which one or more glucosamine glycan chains are joined covalently to a membrane protein or a secreted protein. Proteoglycans are major components of connective tissues such as cartilage in which there are many non-covalent interactions with other proteoglycans proteins and glucosamine glycans provide strength and resilience. Glycoproteins have one or several oligosaccharides of varying complexity joined covalently to a protein. They are found on the outer surface of the plasma membrane, in the extracellular matrix and in the blood. Inside cells, they are found in specific organelles such as Golgi complex, secretory granules and lysosomes. Glycolipids are membrane lipids in which the hydrophilic head groups are oligosaccharides which as in glycoprotein act as specific sites for recognition by carbohydrate binding proteins. Now let's understand these three types one by one. Proteoglycans. Proteoglycans are the compounds consisting of a protein bonded to mucopolysaccharide groups present especially in connective tissue. Proteoglycans are a major component of the animal extracellular matrix, the filler substance existing between cells in an organism. They form large complexes with other proteoglycans, hyaluronin and to other fibrous matrix proteins like collagen. Mammalian cells can produce at least 30 types of molecules that are members of the proteoglycan superfamily. These molecules act as tissue organizers influence the development of specialized tissue, mediate the activities of various growth factors and regulate the extracellular assembly of collagen fibrils. Now let's talk about glycoproteins. Glycoproteins is a class of protein which have carbohydrate groups attached to the polypeptide chain. Glycoproteins give structural support to cells, help to form connective tissues and facilitate digestion by producing secretions and mucus in the gastrointestinal tract. Glycoproteins are handy cell components and are found in many places within cells. The carbohydrate is attached at its anomeric carbon through a glycosidic link to the hydroxyl of a serine or threonine residues, O-linked, or through an N-glycosyl link to the amide nitrogen of an asparagine residue. Some glycoproteins have a single oligosaccharide chain but many have more than one. Many of the proteins secreted by eukaryotic cells are glycoproteins including most of the proteins of blood. For example, immunoglobulins, antibodies and certain hormones such as follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone are glycoproteins. Many milk proteins including lactalbumin and some of the proteins secreted by the pancreas such as ribonuclease are glycosylated as are most of the proteins contained in lysosomes. The biological advantage of adding oligosaccharides to proteins are not fully understood. Now let's talk about glycolipids and lipopolysaccharides. These are the lipids that are covalently bound to oligosaccharides. Lipids and proteins on the cell membrane surface often have short carbohydrate chains protruding out from the cell surface known as glycolipids and glycoproteins. They form hydrogen bonds with the water molecules surrounding the cell and thus help to stabilize membrane structure. Gangliocytes are membrane lipids of eukaryotic cells in which the polar head group, the part of the lipid that forms the outer surface of the membrane is a complex oligosaccharide containing sialic acid and other monosaccharide residues. Besides that, lipopolysaccharides are the dominant surface features of the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria such as E. coli and Salmonella typhimurium. These molecules are prime targets of the antibodies produced by the 
vertebrates immune system in response to bacterial infection and are therefore important determinants of the serotype of bacterial strains. Serotypes are strains that are distinguished on the basis of antigenic properties. Dear students, that's all about today's lecture. Hope you have understood and enjoyed well. Thank you and goodbye.